Thank you. Yeah, Lawrence is our uh, our new clerk for the employment well, committee. So. <laughs> Okay, morning everyone, members in the room and those joining us online. Uh, welcome to this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council's Employment and Staffing Committee. My name is Councillor Henry Batchelor and I'm the chair of this committee. Um, please can those present in the council chamber note that everything on your desks, including your laptop screens, is likely to be broadcast online at some point. Uh, the camera follows the microphone being switched on, so councillors and officers are advised to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up with the microphone. Please can those participating in the meeting via the live stream indicate you wish to speak via the chat column. Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose other than indicating a wish to speak. Please make sure your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless invited to do so otherwise. Please ensure you've switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. Um, when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you've finished addressing the meeting, please turn your microphone off. Speak slowly, clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. Members in the room, please note if we, if we need a vote on any item, we should do so via the microphones. Only those present in the chamber can vote or propose or second recommendations. Um, I can confirm we have a full house, so the meeting's quorum, so we shall proceed. Uh, and also, please feel free to note, as Councillor Howe's already pointed out, that we have a new Democratic Services Officer supporting this committee, um, Mr. Lawrence Damari Homan. Lawrence, I don't know if you want to say a quick hello. Yeah, morning, Chair. Thanks for the, uh, the welcome. Looking forward to working with you all. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll start with the items of business on the agenda, members, starting with number one, apologies for absence. I believe we have none, but Lawrence, if you could confirm. Yeah, I can confirm. No apologies for absence. Thank you very much. Uh, item two, declarations of interest. Uh, members have any items they wish to declare interests on. Not seeing any hands. So if anything becomes apparent to members as we go through the meeting, please do just declare them. Item three, minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, members, we have minutes on pages one through to three of our agendas. Uh, do any members have any uh, issues of accuracy they wish to raise? No, I see none. So I will sign those as a correct record at the end of the meeting. So we'll now move on to the substantive items on the agenda, starting with item four, which is an item, uh, an annual item we receive here, which is an update on the pay policy statement. Um, I could ask Mr. Jeff Memory, Head of Human Resources, who is joining us online. Jeff, welcome. Um, if you'd like to introduce the report and hold on for any questions, please. Yeah, yes, certainly. Thank you, Chair. Um, good, good morning, members. Um, uh, as as uh, you you have said, Chair, this is a uh, an annual statutory requirement that we publish our pay policy statement. There have been no significant changes to the uh, the, the the statement over the, the the course of the last year, apart, of course, from the fact that it's been revised to reflect the fact that uh, of, of the pay settlement for. Uh, uh, for, for this year, the uh, perhaps the, the biggest thing to note uh, on the uh, uh, the statement is that un, uh, unusually and, and certainly different to the national situation, the gender pay gap in this authority is actually in favour of, of females rather than males, which is uh, I think reflective of the fact that we pursue um, a, 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 a very equal pay. Uh, a, a, sorry. A, equal pay arrangements and that we're committed to equality uh, as part of the work that we do in this authority. Um, I'm happy to uh, take any questions that members may have on the statement and ask that um, uh, you recommend it to, to Council um, uh, in March. Jeff, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, members, do we have any questions on the pay policy statement starting at page five on our agendas? Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Through yourself, um, and you know, it's it's always been seen as a, a positive thing that's in favour of, of females on the pay gap. However, I I do wonder whether it would be worth just looking at the numbers underneath that because we have a, a female chief exec and a female sort of deputy chief exec. So it could be it could be that given they are the, the top jobs at that, she might be obscuring. The, the information slightly so we're not getting a it can overcompensate 
for other areas. So I'm just wondering whether there is potential to just check that um, and maybe take out senior leadership team and kind of having a having almost to break it down into two areas um, so that the top jobs, as it were, don't actually blur the picture. Um, but obviously, um, like you say, I, I do believe that we're a good on equalities at the council as an employer. So it's not trying to take away from it, but I, I do think for clarity, we probably should look at the two variations, Chair. Thank you, Jeff. I don't know how uh, easy it is, not maybe immediately or today, but how easy it is to separate the chief exec and the chief operating officer out of the table at point one point one. Yeah, yes, we can certainly uh, look to bring that back to the the next meeting of this committee, Chair. Sure, or even email it round after the meeting once the information has been collated. Certainly. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Claire Dornton, Please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so my question really is also about um, this table, and it's just to ask Jeff if he, if he has any idea of whether or not we are outliers, whether or not South Cambs is outliers, or whether in fact we're part of a trend um, in equality um, and female leadership. It, it certainly seems to be the case that the public sector uh, is is more uh, evenly balanced when it comes to, to female leadership and there are a number of local authorities I, I don't remember off the top of my head I'm, I'm, I'm afraid um, councillor exactly how many but there are a number of authorities where the the chain gender pay gap is in favor of of, uh, of females I, I have to uh, do a bit more research and get that information and send it to you outside of the committee if that's okay thank you very much Jeff um, Members, any further questions on the pay policy? I don't see any. Um, so we have a recommendation, members, if there's no more questions, which I can never find in these papers. Um, someone, can, someone help me? Page, <laughs> Page five. five. Thank you. Uh, so we have a recommendation to consider the updated pay policy, which I believe we've done, and also to recommend the pay policy statement to full council as Jeff mentioned at the start, which will be the March meeting. Um, members, I don't think there's any, I haven't heard any dissent to that, so can I take that decision by affirmation? Agreed, so that is agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, we move on to agenda item five, which is an item on the hybrid working policy, which was a supplement to our agenda papers members. Did everyone receive this or no? no. Yeah, I, I have it. It was a supplement to our our agendas, which was emailed around by yourself, Lawrence. Yeah. Have you not seen it? Um, if you like, we can come back to this item if you need, because I believe it's on the... Sure? Yeah, happy to carry on? Yeah, okay. Okay, members, so yeah, agenda item five, hybrid working policy. Um, we have, this is a new policy obviously to accommodate hybrid working at the council. Uh, Jeff, I believe you will be introducing this item as well. Uh, yes, yes indeed. Um, uh, apologies members, the, the person who was due to uh, present isn't able to be here today. And apologies, I'm having some internet issues at home, so I'm sorry if I'm not coming across clearly. No problem. Um, this hybrid working policy is looking to do two things. I think members will be very aware of the fact that because of um, COVID-19, we've had to already work very differently um, in the council than we had done previously. And we needed to put something in place that recognised that in a, a, a more a, a efficient way, um, given the fact that it's looking like that's, that's going to be a longer term arrangement than we initially anticipated it to be. But also we're in a position where adapting to these new working arrangements have proven that actually they can be more efficient and effective for officers when they're working in, in this more flexible way. Now, what this policy looks to do is to enable us to take the best of the way that we're working at the moment uh, 
and carry that into the future and combine it with the way that we've worked effectively in the past. So what this isn't doing is looking to continue the current working arrangements where most people are working from home pretty much all of the time. But what it is looking to do is put us in a position where we give teams the flexibility to ensure that we meet the needs of our customers, whether that be um, members or residents or other members of staff, in a way that uh, can maximise the efficiency of the team, use the technology that we've got available to us, and also make us an attractive employer so that in those, um, that, that, that those areas where it's sometimes difficult to recruit technical experts, such as in, say, planning or environmental health, for example, we can cast our net a little bit wider because people would have to commute less. Uh, enabling people to commute less is also positive in terms of the, the green agenda. There is no proposal to make any changes that would require changes to people's contracts, but we, what we are looking to do with this policy is to give teams the flexibility to look at how they can work best. We will continue to provide a full office environment for people who are, work best by coming into the office. And I know members will be keen to, to ensure that uh, they've got access to, um, to, to staff on a, a more regular basis when things settle down. And this policy looks to ensure that that's delivered as well. Um, it's not just about having everybody working from home. It's about making sure that, that we, we're able to work from home when needed and that where that can happen, it's hap it happens in an efficient and effective way and that people have the, uh, the, the equipment that they need to, uh, to, to work efficiently. There will always be some roles where working from home or working at a hub or working out on the district just isn't appropriate. Um, there, there will always be traditional roles where people need to come into the office in the way that they always have been. A, a particularly good example might be the waste operatives that go around and collect rubbish every day. There's, there's, there's no way that those people can work from home, for example. But what we are trying to do is to, is to allow that flexibility that, that means that we can meet our residents, our members and our customers' needs as well as ensuring that we're an attractive um, employer for staff. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions that members may have. Great, thank you for that uh, introduction, Jeff. Uh, we have a question from Heather Williams for you. Thank you. Through yourself, Chair, and maybe more of a, a comment or food for thought, um, is that given this is quite a new thing, I would suggest that it's reviewed quickly um, so it's not something, I know some of our policies don't get reviewed for several years. I'd suggest that as we're sort of looking at this now, that it should be reviewed in 12 months in our recommendations to Cabinet. So that would be my first, first sort of comment on it um, and whether that's possible. The other thing that I think we should just be mindful of is that flexibility is great, I think, for, you know, particularly we see, we've just spoken about the female positive in, in local government and a lot of that um, is to do with childcare arrangements and the flexibility around holidays and things like things like those um, but we do need to be mindful that while we're opening up the office for people to come in that un unless they may actually need access to those people that prefer to work at home um, and I don't know if anybody else has ever looked at Myers-Briggs and you know it's it's a case of preferencing and how people work best but but I think we ought to be mindful that people that work better at the council and are would be classed as more extroverted, so like that um, environment, than somebody that's got introvert uh, preferences, that they have those people available. That's my only concern is by, it's great to have choice, but are we actually disadvantaging people? And I'm thinking particularly on career progression as well. We know that's an issue that people want to progress their careers and that's one of the reasons why they quite often leave. Um, a lot of that is having that access to people um, that, you know, if they're only coming in one day a week because our policies allow that, then we might actually be, with, with well, me well meant, but triggering ripple, ripple consequences. Um, which I think is another reason for, for reviewing it quickly. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Yeah, I completely agree on the uh, regular reviewing of the policy, and clearly the Employment Committee can have some input into that as well before Cabinet makes a decision on it. But, um, Jeff, I didn't know if you had any comments on the second part of uh, Councillor Williams's comments there. Um, 
No, I, I absolutely agree. Um, one of the ways that we're looking to implement this is through a series of team charters where the teams are looking at how they best deliver for for, for their, their their customers, whether they're internal or external customers and also team members. And I absolutely agree that people will need to be able to have access to, um, uh, to other members of the team to support them and help them in decision making. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting point about um, extroverts and introverts. Um, uh, I, I will uh, talk with colleagues in HR as to how we can best ensure that that the people are not disadvantaged if they're working in, in, a, in, in either way. One of the things that we're looking at, for example, is to improve the, uh, the, the hybrid technology in the meeting rooms here. So cause, because when, if you're having a joint meeting where some people are um, uh, 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 joining uh, remotely, as, as we're having with the, uh, uh, the, the this meeting here today, the experience has to be as good for both the person joining remotely as the person in the office, so that neither neither side's advantaged or disadvantaged. So we're looking at how we do that best. But um, but I certainly agree with the the, the points raised, and we'll, we'll we'll be having as part of the HR uh, team's implementation of this. We'll look at ways that we can monitor to ensure that actually we give that sort of balance between the different sort of uh, the different types of, of people that might be using this uh, the, these arrangements. I, I hope I think. Uh, covered your, your question, Councillor Williams, but if there's anything I haven't covered, please, please, uh, d d you know, don't hesitate to either uh, ask, ask here or, or contact me outside of the meeting. Thank you, Jeff. And obviously, you know, in the uh, in what we feed back to Cabinet as well, I'm sure that your comments have been captured there so we can feed that back to Cabinet when they debate this at their next meeting. Um, who's next? We have Councillor Dawson, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's taking up your last point, Jeff, about um, technology. So it, it's really sort of, and it's an equality issue, an equality of technology, if you like. Um, so hybrid working really depends a lot on access to technology, access for members of the team, but also access for members and members of the public. So I'd want us to be sure that when we move towards this, that we are clear um, that we're doing everything we can to ensure access, equality of access to the technology. So I know, for example, that um, members of staff communicate a lot through Teams, Teams phone calls, as well as Teams online in the way that we do. That isn't the case for, um, for councillors. We don't have uh, Teams calling. Um, and I, I just also want to be mindful of members of the public work that we, we do need to ensure the quality of access in the same way that somebody can walk in here and talk to a person. Jeff, any comments there or is that? Yeah, no, I'm happy to make it. It's sort of a, a linked point, um, but I am currently in discussions with 3CICT about members' access to, to teams because I think that's a, an excellent point, sl sl slightly aside from, from this discussion. But at the moment, um, I, from what I understand, you say members don't have access to Teams calls, members don't have access to shared documents stored on Teams, um, members don't have access to um, uh, officers' calendars, for example. Uh, so we're, we're in discussions at the moment to see how they, that, that can be provided. Um, certainly in, in terms of, of members of the public, there's absolutely no intention to take away from members of the public any way of accessing our, 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 our people. So we'll continue to offer the, the opportunity for members of the public to come into the office uh, uh, to have face-to-face -face contact if, if they want that. Uh, we're looking to strengthen that their ability to contact us by telephone, as well as um, uh, allow access through the, the net and, and other areas. Um, but you know, there's absolutely no intention to restrict the way that members of the public can contact us as a council. Great, thank you very much, Jeff. We now have a question from the Vice Chair, Councillor Percival. Thank you. Uh, apologies for that. Um, th thank you very much for the for the paper. Um, I'm just skim reading it now, actually. So many apologies. I've not had the opportunity to read it before now. Um, my question is just around um, uh, flexible working requests and whether this hybrid working policy would would 
would replace the need for flexible working applications. Um, you've mentioned that no terms and conditions are changed as a result of this, but I'd like to just better understand, um, would there still be requirements for people to submit flexible working applications? And if so, when might that happen? And my second comment is around, um, whilst we have more and more staff sort of working, working from home, how we are ensuring as a council that their health and well-being is being monitored. Um, I think it's very easy for people's mental health to be affected whilst they're working from home and for potentially that to get missed by line managers. So just wondering again what's happening to support our staff. Um, uh, yes, yes, certainly. Um, flexible working is, 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 is a uh, or the, the the right to request flexible working is a statutory right. Although I, I suspect that you're you're correct, the implementation of this policy would significantly limit the the number of times when people would have to um uh, to, to request that because they've they've got that almost built into the policy. I may I know oh, I've got a couple of HR colleagues with me on the call. Um, I may ask Lindsay Smith um, to just uh, comment if I've missed anything there, Lindsay. Uh, no, just to add to that, really, I think in terms of the flexible working requests, that would be whether somebody wants to make a permanent change to their working hours, whether it's the, the reducing or increasing their hours or their days. Um, that would still be required um, to apply for that under the flexible requ working request, whereas the hybrid working policy is more around, as Jeff said, working with the team, doing the team charters to think about how we work as a team and a council to enable us to deliver our services. So there, there is a bit of a difference still, I would say. Um, if you want me to move on to the other point about the health and well-being, I'm happy to answer that one as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're providing training for staff uh, and, and managers, but, but I'm happy for you to answer that as well, Lindsay. Yeah, um, so obviously it's been nearly two years now since we've been working from home um, throughout the pandemic and the HR team have put on various um, initiatives to ensure that our staff health and well-being um, is met and as Jeff says we've we've done training for managers but we've also done various different sessions for staff and that is still ongoing as well um, and and we're not looking to you know to change that um, in the near future I don't know if you've got any other questions no that's it thank you very much both of you for your input there um councillor Howell please Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think, first of all, this is an excellent start. I think this is really good. This has been forced upon us through obvious reasons. And I think we're going to be playing catch up for a little while until we get into it. And, and that's fine. That's no problems at all. Um, one of the things I saw on here was the security of documentation and um, uh, how we're looking at that. And again, I think that's very good. But I think this is a golden opportunity, not only for us to look at how the officers do security of uh, documentation, but also members as well because they have also the secure documentation. Admittedly, the um, uh, officers may have more uh, personal information uh, while they're dealing with housing claim benefits or, or um, other things such as that. And the, the councillors may have more business related, but they're still security documents that need to be looked at. So um, I'm very pleased with this. I, I've just looked at it here now, and um, I think it's, it's very, very good. And I think it's a, it's a document we're going to have to keep on expanding and adapting and one thing or another as the situation changes and as we're all learning. But um, Chairman, I, I think this is excellent, and I think it's the way forward. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's any comments to be made there, um, unless Jeff or Lindsay you wish to. Not, not essential. No, OK. Thank you very much. Um, we go to Councillor John Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm picking up a point that uh, Councillor Dalton made about uh, members' access to IT. Uh, Cabinet are aware that um, members have not kept up with the development of Council Anywhere for officers. And um, we, have, um, we intend to put into next year's budget um, money to fund better support for members 
with, I, with, with IT developments to enable members to, to match the level of um, home working for, by, by officers. Um, I think hardware is also an issue that um, this council um, needs to look at. Um, the equipment that members have, because it's their own personal equipment, varies greatly. And um, we, in, to enable members to um, take part in the um, Council Anywhere um, setup, um, there needs to be a common uh, minimum um, sort of hardware um, specification. And we are acutely aware that obviously some members may not be able to, uh, to meet that. I mean, it's interesting that um, many years ago before you know people even thought about paperless councils um, members were actually given a lot more support than they are now when i joined this council i got given a laptop i got given a printer and i got given a filing cabinet to ensure that to ensure that um to ensure that our papers were secure at home um, members don't get any of that now and uh, we need, I think, to, and, and Cabinet is acutely aware that we need to start looking at the facilities that we give members to ensure that they have just as much, um, you know, they, they have the equipment to do their job. And, uh, and we intend, as I say, to put some money into next year's budget uh, and also to appoint um, a post within democratic services to specifically look after members' IT. Uh, requirements. I think that's Aaron, isn't it, <laughs> at the moment? <laughs> but no, yeah, just, just to back that up, I mean, when I started in 2014, um, I was offered an iPad, albeit not <laughs> particularly compatible with uh, a lot of council work, but, you know, we were offered some form of technology, so, you know, I welcome the uh, improvements, and, you know, I hope that's been uh, captured in the comments, Lawrence, that we can then pass back to, to Cabinet. Um, one more speaker, we have Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so joining in 2018, I got offered nothing. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm fortunate that through work, obviously, we have up-to-date technology and things like that. I'd also say that it's... Um, so I, I try to do the paper-free, paper, paper free, um, but one of the biggest problems, although I have the hardware, I, I take Councillor John Williams's point, and I agree with it, particularly if we're talking about equality um, for, for members as well, that uh, internet access, the fact that in the chamber, so I'm very conscious and therefore do have paper copies of confidential information because when we're in the council chamber, because we can't get onto the system, and I understand the reasons for that because it's our own equipment, but if we had sort of a councillor um, network, because otherwise we have to open confidential documents on a public internet, you know, on a public Wi-Fi, and I, I do have concerns about those security risks. And, and it's, it's silly sometimes, it's one or two pages, but once it's printed, it then has to have a cover note and everything else. Um, and, uh, and I am very conscious of that, or equally on the, um, ex, you know, I'm, I have an iPad which has roaming on it. Not everybody does, um, there, and you have to pay for that data. So that's the other thing is um, I know particularly when we have things like full council and there's a lot of us in here, the demand, the public Wi-Fi just doesn't work. Um, and so it can actually be quite costly for the running costs as well and for internet access. So I think that's something, I know other councils, they will have in their council chamber for councillors like a, a broadband circuit of, of their own. Um, I, I do think that that would be better than us using roaming or public Wi-Fi, particularly on the confidentiality documents. Thank you, Chair. No, thank you for that. Yeah, fully support that as someone who's constantly in need of Wi-Fi. I appreciate the need for a good connection and also a secure one to open uh, confidential items. So again, yeah, I think that's been captured by, by Lawrence there. He's going to feed that back to Cabinet. Um, I don't think we have any further speakers or comments on this, members. So what we're being asked to do in the recommendations um, is that we review the proposed new policy, provide feedback, which I think we've We've succinctly done, and then refer to Cabinet for their uh, perusal and then, uh, I assume, approval. So, members, are we all content that we can, um, that we can do that? Agreed. Agreed? Yep. 
Thank you very much, everybody. So that was item five. We're now moving on to agenda item six, which is the new performance development policy. It starts on page 19 of our agendas, members. And Mr. Membry, I think back over to you for an introduction, please. Yes, it, it, indeed. Again, uh, uh, apologies. I've, I've had to pick up some um, uh, some of the presentations that, uh, due, due to the fact that someone else wasn't able to make it. So I'm sorry you're hearing from me uh, quite so much. Um, this performance uh, development policy is looking to do a number of things. First of all, it's, it's looking to make the policy more accessible because the, our, our previous policy didn't meet all of the accessibility guidelines. But probably more importantly, it's looking to make a conversation on performance part of the regular day-to-day -day interaction between um, managers and their teams. Um, currently, we have a, a, a significant um, um, annual meeting with a uh, performance development framework arrangement in place, and we, we're intending to keep that annual meeting, but to ensure that actually discussions around performance are undertaken in an informal way uh, on a regular basis. So we're looking to ensure we don't get to a situation, if at all possible, where somebody has suddenly has um, uh, performance management issues because those potential issues are spotted and headed off at an early stage. I think it's important that our managers work closely with all of their team to get the best out of them. People have already highlighted the fact that we're already operating in a, a different sort of environment. And um, you don't, if you're not going to be sitting in an office with somebody uh, all day and, and keeping an eye on them, then making sure you have that relationship where you've got regular conversations going on around what's going on in their work, what's going on in their lives, and what's going on with their performance is, is important. So this, this framework looks to put that in place. It continues to allow us to uh, evaluate um, people's performance and look at how we can meet the needs of those people that have, uh, are performing well and have got aspiring uh, to develop, and also ensure that we can recognise those people who may not be looking to progress in the council, but continue to provide us with a steady, reliable stream of work that, are, that, that in many ways make them effectively the engine room of the council that keep us going forward um, in, in a steady and positive way. Um, I'd be happy to try and answer any uh, questions that, that come up about this policy, but again, I may need the support of Lindsay Smith to deal with some of the more technical um, questions you might have. Great, thank you very much, Jeff. And we do have one question straight off the bat from Councillor Daunton, please. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Um, it, it's actually a question about the word performance. Um, if somebody is, is happy in their job and feels comfortable in their job, feels that it's the right job for them, it's not really a matter of performance, is it? It's a, a matter of enjoying the job and being part of the team. Performance has a sort of, I can't think of the right word, but maybe you know what I'm getting at. It, it, it's a sort of scoring, it, it's got a sort of scoring element to it. Um, and so I'm just sort of quite, anxious about the whole notion of performance. wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, I mean, that, I understand what you're, what you're saying. Um, and it's absolutely fine. If you've got somebody that is happy in their job, committed to doing a good job, and is actually, uh, 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 that, that's really positive, but they do need to be you know, we're, we're paying the, the, the money, we're, we're managing the, the, the public's money here. We do need to ensure that we're delivering value for money for, for our, our residents. So they do need to meet a, 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 a particular standard. It, it, um, I absolutely agree that it doesn't mean that somebody is necessarily wanting to, to, to progress, move on to a different job or, or anything like that. And and it's very valuable to have those steady, reliable people who, who, are, who, who come in, who do a good job day in, day out. But we do have to ensure that they continue to do a good job. I mean, there have been examples of people who may have been in a job for some time and be um, performing well, and then, then the performance might dip for a reason. And that might be because of changes at work or changes in the home life, for example. And being able to keep track of that and identify that there has been a dip and perhaps have those conversations with those people to see how we can support them through what what, they, what difficult time they might be going through is, is quite important. So although 
um, I, I, I agree. This is not about saying, well, you did 10 last week, so we expect you to do 12 next week. And if, if they're doing 10 and they're doing it regularly and they're doing it to a good standard, then that's that's absolutely fine. Um, but we do need to make sure that that that, that things are, are, are working well and that and, and, and that they're continuing to be able to, to deliver for residents. I don't know if Lindsay's got anything to, to add to, to that. Muted, oh. Lindsay. I just realised I should have learned by now. <laughs> um, not really, Jeff, to be honest. Um, I mean, I just think one of the things that we we have done is we're talking about development um, rather than management. So in the policy itself, um, the intention is that it is a positive um, it's not that people feel that their performance is being managed, it's that there are opportunities for people that want to develop, but as Jeff says, even those who don't want the career progression, we want to ensure that they're still doing what we need them to do and doing it well on a day-to-day -day basis, on an ongoing basis. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Councillor Percival. Thank you. Um, it's, it's really great actually to see this policy and procedure and to see it written using such positive language and really positive intent. Um, and I really like the fact that you're encouraging continuous um, performance mm. assessment rather than, which is often the case just once a year as part of the annual performance review. So, so I really like that. Um, a couple of things that, that I wanted to ask you about. Um, the first is that um, this is largely about um, giving line managers the scope for providing feedback to employees. I wondered if you'd considered as part of the policy um, seeking feedback from wider sources, so other colleagues and peers as well. It's not just line managers who are able to make an assessment on performance. And in fact, sometimes line managers aren't close enough to the work and the detail to, to give that in-depth feedback. Um, the other question was around the behavioural assessment. I wasn't clear. It made reference to the fact that behaviours are also considered as part of the reviews, but it's not clear exactly how. Um, we know that it's not just important that people achieve and they reach outcomes, but it's equally important that it's done with the, with the right attitude and the right behaviours. So I wasn't clear about how the behavioural assessment um, forms part of that review. And then the final comment was just around, um, I can see that there's lots of opportunity for managers to give feedback to their employees. Is there also the opportunity for employees to provide feedback to their line managers? But I'm very supportive of the policy. I think it's really positively worded. Didn't see you able to answer those? Uh, yeah, so the behaviour, so the council, we've got our behaviour framework um, and we would be looking when we have the conversations um, with our employees, the kind of how they're performing would be aligned to the council's behaviours really. Um, I, sorry, I haven't had time to have sight of this policy before the meeting today. Um, so what I'm not sure is if it includes the behaviours framework um, that's in there, but there certainly is a behaviours framework that we would be looking to, and as part of the conversations, that's what we would be expecting. Um, in terms of the um, opportunity for the employee to provide feedback, again, I believe there is a performance conversation template that we would be um, expecting the manager to use when they're having the conversations with their employees. And in that, there would be an opportunity for the employee to provide feedback as well. So we do see it as a, a two-way conversation, um, not just the line manager giving feedback to the employee. I think that, that the point you were making, Councillor, about the potential for 360 de degree um, feedback is, is an important one. So I'll, I'll discuss that with colleagues about how we can look to ensure that that's part of the, 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 the process, because I absolutely agree that actually colleagues, um, people that work in other departments, customers will, will have a view on how things are delivered. Um, uh, also about the, uh, the, the 
um, the behaviours framework. We're working hard to produce effectively uh, behaviours on a page uh, for members of staff, which not only explain behaviours, but give some examples of good behaviours. And not only does it cover the behaviours we can expect from, from all of our colleagues, but part of that includes the, the way that we use our behaviours and the way that we lead as managers. So it, it will include that, that as a manager, you know, that the manager will be supportive. And uh, when it comes to um, having the, the discussions with the, 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 man, the, the line managers, obviously people like myself will be talking to them about ensuring that, that they're supporting their staff in the appropriate way, because that's part of what, what, you know, what their job is to deliver. <laughs> Thank you for, for taking the time to explain that. Um, I, I'm still a little unsure about, and it'd be really helpful if perhaps for the, for the next meeting we could just have some clarification on how um, the behavioural framework is, is used as part of the performance appraisal um, or, or, or just performance conversations. Um, it's, it's sort of referenced in here and it's mentioned, which is wonderful, but it's just not clear about how that's actually applied and assessed. Certainly, so, we'll, we'll bring that to the next meeting with the you. chair's uh, permission. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next, we have Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think um, this is a. It's good to have this document, and I think because it is, as has been said, you know, taxpayers' money, and we have to ensure that there's there's value for money. Um, but I think it does need to come alongside other things. So the performance is Im important, but we also want quality as well as quanti you know, quantity, it's, it can't be either or, it has to be a balance of both. Um, but also, the, the way that this information is used is very important, not just for the individuals, but if you, for example, you know, have a team, you've got different teams in the council, not, I don't mean software, I mean actual physical people, um, and uh, how actually performance gets, gets treated, whether it's seen as a, a stick to, you know, encourage people forcefully you know you must get your performance up or this that and the other because of x you know or actually do we notify or notice as a an issue and and support them to in, improve um but equally that people don't actually feel punished because of their performance so they've got really good you know the team's done really well so what we're going to do is give you a load more work and we're going to take a couple of people out of your team because you're doing so well um, you don't need those people, but we're going to give you this work as well. So I, I have seen, you know, not saying here, but in, in work-based places, both of those things um, use that actually we can have all these documents in the world, but we won't get good performance if people feel they're either going to be punished for it or they're going to work and do not good quality of work because they're worried about, about these documents. So very good that it's in place and it's an important document for value for money and, and supportive of it. But if we can make sure that um, how it's communicated is really important. So I think, and we can see, we're gonna talk about that probably later on about communications. Um, of a document like this, it has to be communicated properly what the intention of it is um, and that people can work without fear of consequence in, in either direction. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you for that, and um, I can hear Lawrence beavering away, writing some notes, so I'm sure we can pass those comments on when we, uh, uh, when we come to the end of this item. Um, Councillor Hart, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've just got a couple of questions, and I, and I hope I'm, they're okay questions to ask. Um, and I, I agree, I mean, I think this, this policy, certainly in light of we're talking about people working perhaps more remotely, you know, encouraging conversations, informal conversations can be a really good way of, of just acknowledging people exist and that they're doing a good job and recognising that. So I, I, I value that, so thank you. Um, is it okay if I just sort of go through, there are a couple of paragraphs where I've, I keep reading lines and I think I don't understand. So is that okay? And, and is it if I, if I reference them as we go, go through? And apologies if I'm just reading them a different way to other people. Uh, so on page 25 of our, our pack, which is page two, um, of the 11 page document uh, the uh, under item one the second paragraph down aim of the procedure the final sentence says the procedure is aimed at providing a framework for conversations however aims to accommodate flexibility and approach and I keep reading that and I 
I'm not, not sure I understand. I think I understand what it means. It said that it's going to be flexible. So I'm just wondering if the wording there just needs to be slightly different. The however, I'm, I'm not sure. And I, I don't know if I'm being pedantic, but I, I think it's saying that it, it's, um, there'll be a framework, but there's going to be flexibility in the way that framework is delivered. Is that what that means? Uh, any clarity from Jeff or Lindsay? Yeah, I mean, the, the intention there is to recognise that different people in different roles probably need to have slightly tailored conversations so that uh, if, if you're talking to somebody who's in a, a, a managerial role, the nature of that of the conversation you will have with them as their line manager will be slightly different to, to the, uh, the the conversation you might have who's with somebody who's doing a job, for example, as a, as a benefit uh, processor who, who's processing work. It's also... so so. Um, some type of work, for example, you you would you would probably see regular. Uh, how can I put? You know, the turnaround times might be days or weeks. So the sort of you you would you would talk about um, a, a change that you want to make, and you would expect to see that change delivered in a, in a, sort of a week or a couple of weeks. Whereas with other, with if somebody's working on a project, for example, you might talk with that person about the change that they need to make, and you'd expect to see the results of that change, you know, in, in, in a month or two rather than than a week or two. So rather than set a rigid framework which says, well, you have this conversation then, and then you go and have a, a conversation in two weeks' time, and then you do that, it's to, it's to say to them that you've got to recognise that the nature of the work that they're doing might be different and to tailor you know, those conversations around what the, the work that they're doing and the changes that you need them to make. Um, it, 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 it's just trying to get away from sort of a tick box situation where people are almost going through, well, I've got to do that and I've got to do that, and it doesn't always make full sense. So it's to try and give them that flexibility. Thank you, thank you. And as I, I imagine there'll be lots more feedback in terms of sort of wording and what Councillor Heather Williams said about communication, it's key, isn't it, the, what is written um, is perceived, uh, is understood to the shared meaning in that. So, um, is it okay if I go on to another one? <laughs> um, which is, uh, I think it's just a, a paragraph that needs to be shifted up. It's on page five of the, of the document, and it's under um, managers preparing for the annual performance development conversation. The final paragraph there says, if you have identified any potential development opportunities, you may also want to discuss these with your manager. I think that needs to be in the, the bit that comes under employees preparing for the annual performance development conversation. Is that fair to say, Jeff? Or? Yes, it certainly looks like that. We'll, we'll yeah. get that. We'll get that changed. My, my apologies for that. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, I think there was just one other one, or well, maybe two more. Apologies. Uh, page eight of 11, the document, the final paragraph there says the how we do things now forms part of an employee's performance and where they are placed on the nine box, box performance grid. And I, I didn't understand <laughs> what that meant. Jeff or Lindsay, I'd imagine it's the uh, referring to point six in the report, which is the previous pages. Uh, yes, but my, my apologies, Chair, taking me a little time. Like, like um, Lindsay, neither of us are the authors of the report, so we're having to. Um, I mean, we only knew this morning that we were covering, so having to go back through. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, the, the, the wording could certainly be improved. Um, I'll, I'll have a word with um, uh, the, the, the report's author and see if we can perhaps clarify that. Um, I'm not a hundred. I think you're probably right, Chair, but I, I can't be a hundred percent certain. Uh, without double checking that. Okay. I mean, maybe when we come to the uh, the recommendation, obviously we've had lots of comments from uh, from members today. If those can be sort of encapsulated and and sent forward to to offices Indeed. before the policy is signed off, I think that would be useful. Of course, Councillor, yes. Councillor Hart. You have um, one more. I'll just do the last one then, and, and I do thank you. I'm mindful to say you are here representing this, and, and, and may not um, know the document as well as other people. So, and apologies, but I just thought. I would feel more comfortable if I've asked the questions. So it's uh, uh, page nine of 11, and it's the one, two, the fourth paragraph down. The informal performance development conversations are equally as important as our new ways of working means we need to be flexible about how we manage performance. And again, it just it just didn't, it, I, I couldn't really make sense of it. Yep, yep. Sorry, we'll get that tidied up as well. Thank you. Um, Councillor. Thank you very much. I think that's just a grammatical one, Jeff, but yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you to Councillor Hart for her <coughs> diligent proofreading. Um, we have...
Councillor Dawson, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it's probably a question for both of you. Um, we've got two really interesting, good new policies here. I just wanted to ask a, a little about the um, implementation of them, the training for the people who will be implementing them. If you could just talk to us about that management training. Yes, certainly. What we're looking to do is have a effectively a year long um, modular training course for uh, members where uh, sorry, for officers, my apologies, members. Um, where once a month they'll be have given half day sessions on relevant topics and then uh, they'll be given the opportunity to put what they've learned into practice. We're looking to cooperate with our colleagues in uh, uh, and other local authorities nearby to, to share the costs of this service. And we've already had discussions with a local provider. Um, there'll be some compulsory elements to the training, but there'll also be some flexible elements where um, managers can choose between a, a, a couple of options so that they can, based upon the conversations that they've had with their loan manager about what their needs for development are, they can ensure that they're choosing modules that, that meet that, uh, that, that development need. So we're putting quite a lot of time and effort in, because as you, as you rightly say, there's a number of policy, new policies coming to light. Um, and we recognise that, that all of our um, line managers are going to need the, um, the, the skills to implement that. So what we're looking to do is to give them uh, a, a set of tools that, are, that, that allow them to implement these, these things well and properly. And as has been mentioned, you know, how we, how we communicate this to um, all of our line managers to enable them to implement it uh, properly is important. So by having the, these, um, these, this modular training course, we're looking to ensure that we both communicate it well and give them the tools to deliver uh, the, 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 the new policies with their teams. Is there anything you want to add to that, Lindsay? Uh, just to add that um, we do do annual training for our managers um, and employees actually on the performance development review um, and that that forms part of the annual training programme and it'll fit with what Jeff just said about the, the kind of modular training for our managers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think we have any further uh, questions on the policy. Um, so the recommendation we actually have in the paper, I think, is slightly uh, misworded as it makes it sound like we as the committee are asking to implement the, this new policy, whereas obviously it will be officers that implement the new policy. Um, so members, <coughs> excuse me, I think what the actual recommendation should read is the committee is invited to recommend that officers implement the new updated policy, uh, pending union feedback and also incorporating the comments and suggestions uh, that we've given today. So if everyone's uh, in agreement with that approach, can I have some, a grumble of affirmation? Agreed, yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Lindsay and Jeff, uh, for your input and comments on that. Okay, we now move on to our, two of our regular items, which are quarterly updates on retention and turnover and sickness absence um, from the last quarter. So I think we have Donya Taylor on the line. Donya, good morning. Hi. Hi there, um, and I believe you're presenting both of these reports to us. Yep, uh, yes I am. Um, I think the turnover one is the first one in your agenda pack, is that correct? Yes it is, agenda item 7, members on page 35 of our agendas. So, yeah, we have the information in front of us, Donya, so whenever you're ready please. Okay, um, so the uh, turnover for quarter two um, was, uh, was very low um, and the, on page 36 we've got the graph which shows, um, shows turnover um, since the beginning of uh, quarter one, uh, 2020 to 2021. Now for quarter, quarter two that we only had 16 levers um, across the organisation um, which is very low. Um, having already run the data for quarter three, so kind of like a, a advanced a warning, I guess, of what's to come, um, the uh, turnover for quarter three is, is a lot higher. So it appears uh, we can see that we're getting a bit of a zigzag over the past um, kind of six quarters going up and down. Um, in terms of turnover, there's a lot in the press around uh, 2022 about being the year of the Great Resignation. Um, I don't know if um, any of you have been um, aware of that um, in the press. Um, and, you know, obviously we want to manage uh, turnover as best we can. We obviously, um, turnover is natural and we are going to get some levers, but we obviously don't want it to be um, 
so high that it then becomes uh, an issue from a uh, from a kind of like retention point of view. Um, looking then just specifically at quarter two, um, I'm not going to kind of read every single line in the report. I guess I'm just going to pick out a couple of um, headline uh, information. We obviously are using the exit information um, to exit interviews to gain feedback from staff. Um, we had last year, we had implemented a change, taking it from the line manager doing the exit interviews for from that being HR. Um, that in, in started to increase the amount of exit interviews we were getting, although um, it was still it was still below 50 percent. Um, we have been holding um, online um, like via Teams uh, calls with um with levers as as they happen um and over quarter two and then we have had uh, more responses from exit interviews um as a as a as a result so in point 10 uh, we have a return rate of 83.3 percent compared to 44 percent in quarter one so you can see that's had a dramatic inf uh, effect um and then the feedback that we get we can then obviously uh, work with line managers um to um put any changes into place um Looking at uh, recruitment stats, um, recruitment um, has been uh, busy over a quarter two. In this report, we've um, included more information around, um, uh, we've got more information around the golden hello um, payments and also around the, in, in point 16, the number of uh, temporary workers um, in each department. Um, and I'm just then looking at the wider context. So, um that they were kind of i guess the biggest highlights for me uh, really um when completing this report going through to the conclusion then um we um i guess the the question um is uh, you know we've tried to include as much information um as that that we can gain off our new iTrend um HR system uh, which means that the uh, that the graphs that we've given look a little bit different to what we were doing uh, previously when it was on on our old system uh, and we're trying to make things as automatic as possible because that means there's uh, less room for error um so um, um I guess my question um, to yourselves and the committee is, are you kind of happy with the documents that we've provided in relation to um, to the turnover report this quarter um, and or um, if, if you know there's any particular more details that you want? Um, I do have a couple of um, figures that, that Jonathan wanted me to bring forward, um, which were asked at the last quarter's report. So I'm just going to, um, I've just got that information up um on my screen um so um we uh we have included so um heather williams has had a couple of uh, requests uh on the quarter one report so we have included the percentage of levers um in each of the service areas for the quarter um we have looked at that as a breakdown um and that is on uh, the appendices graphs um and we have also included the information around agency workers um and then there was another request from Councillor Daunton wanted to know about the contact centre um, record of supported career progression. So in relation to that point, um, uh, we uh, in 2020 and 2021, um, we had five internal moves from the contact centre and one move into the contact centre to, to prevent a redundancy. So just in relation to those points from quarter one. Um, so the, that's the end of my presentation on this figure. Great, thank you very much. Um, we do have a couple of questions, but members, if we could be thinking if there's anything uh, additional we'd like to see from HR in these reports moving forward, I think Donya would appreciate that feedback so we can get full, the fuller picture as we, as we need. Um, oh, sorry, just a quick one for me, actually. I'm looking at chart six on page 45. Um, I don't see any numbers associated to that particular pie chart regarding um, the question about whether you work for SCDC again. So I see the uh, percent or the slice of the pie that says no is quite small but i don't know what that means in terms of numbers so in i just numbers, yeah, having yeah, things that's little, fine. Um, numbered would be handy um yeah i'll get that changed okay thank you questions of councillor howell first please thank you chairman <clears throat> sorry thank you chairman um i'm looking on page 43 uh chart one and we have there the target pi with regards to actual levers and one thing or another, and their rolling average is below the target PI. Now, is, is that good or is that bad? I mean, we were, I remember being told once that it's healthy to have a good turnover of staff and one thing or another. 
but I mean, you know, equally, if people are very happy, they'd want to stay and they don't want to go. So how do we really look at those numbers there, if you don't mind, please? On the, on the top chart, I'm really looking at yep, yeah, target yeah, yeah. and, and rolling average. Uh, so the rolling average basically allows allows us to kind of look at the um, look at the uh, over, like, look at the twelve months kind of going on, on average. Um, so what that means is that whereas if you look at chart two, we've got the spikes in the graph where things are going up and down for every single quarter. The rolling average kind of uh, like makes it makes it an average, so you can kind of see what the what the twelve month uh, period is. Um, I like. Quarter two, the turnover was exceptionally low. I mean, it, it was really exceptionally low, only 16 levers. And I did have to, look, when I first got the report, I did have to recheck the figures a couple of times to make sure we, did, we weren't missing anything. And, and, and we obviously weren't. But, um, you know, I, I think there's got to be that balance between a healthy turnover. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing to think about is um, we're looking at uh, voluntary uh, levers. So it was 12 uh, voluntary levers. And then we had four, uh, four levers that were involuntary. Um, uh, again, in in quarter three, we haven't had um, many or I think any dismissals. Um, so looking at thinking about involuntary levers, obviously that's something that we we don't have control over. If someone's dismissed, obviously, you know, we obviously want to um, ensure people are following processes. And if and if they don't for whatever reason, then obviously we have that um, w within our policy. Um, so I think um, quarter two is is low. Uh, you know, and I. I like I said, for quarter three, it then goes and then does spike up again. Um, so I think uh, on the on the face of it, it is good that we that we don't have that many levers. But obviously, we've got things that we can be working on, and and obviously, um, in relation to the policies that have been already been discussed today, um, that that will help um, in terms of think um, in, you know encouraging and empowering employees and managers, and therefore encouraging retention uh, in that way. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that. Now, I think it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, this one is. Yeah, we, we want a turnover of staff, yet we don't, don't want too many staff. I, I also think that the um, policies that you've just put in are going to hopefully make staff re want to remain more. So that target that you have might have to be looked at again. Um, mm -hmm. Because I don't think it's something we, you know, if we are very good employers, which I'd like to think we are, then um, people are not going to want to leave. They're going to want to stay here. But at the same time, um, you know, it's the way things are. And I, I, I'm going to go, if you don't mind, Chairman, just very quickly onto chart five here um, with regards to the rating of um, SEDC and, and poor. Again, we, we score exceptionally good there. We got one yep. thing there, which is with regards to opportunities for personal professional growth, which two people, two people said that we're not very good at out of all the people. Um, so, you know, or, or, or 20% maybe if you want to look at it. So I think it, it's, it's very good. And I think them numbers maybe have to be revised, Chairman, if we're, if we're going to be, uh, especially with where things are in the future. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, a few bits, just first on, um, I'll stick with chart five. Uh, and I, I take the points what you're saying about the, the poor, and we're looking at a very small sample here, but I'm just linking it back to what we were discussing earlier, just looking at the communications. Um, obviously, we want more to be good rather than just you know, not poor, um, even improving the average scores. And given the other documents that are coming round, I think we should, we should note that, that the, the communications, most people haven't said that that's good. Um, and the management working relationships is quite low just with what is coming through and the different policies and everything that. So um, I think that's something that should be noted uh, by those that uh, have, have the ability to look at that and change that. Um, the <coughs> other thing I was, I was looking at is uh, page 46, charts 8 to 11. Um, just looking at the, the grid is the fill rate. Um, it's 55% for the quarter two, 21, 22. If there's a reason for that, because that seems quite a significant drop to the other figures. Um, so that's one question. On the acting up as well, to make sure, you know, at times we've had quite high numbers of people acting up, um, which is great, and acting up can normally you know, be your first step to getting a promotion or that career progression, but making sure that um, people are being supported when acting up and that we are reflecting their extra responsibilities in their pay so we can have some assurances uh, there for those people that are currently acting up 
And you referred to my request um, last time, which was about having agencies as a percentage of the, of the workforce in each department. Could you refer to me in the document whereabouts that is? Because that's something that I've, I felt that uh, I have looked for and quite possibly have overlooked. But um, if you could refer to that, because you mentioned yeah. that being looked at, because last time we had a grid with the number yeah. of... Uh, uh, I'm just wondering if, it's in, if I hadn't included it into the report, bear with me. Um, that's it, thank you, Chair. I'll tell you, whilst you're looking for that, Donya, yeah. I will invite the next speaker, if that's okay. That's fine, um, yeah. I mean, I, say, I, I couldn't see that grid in the appendix either, so I think maybe it's been omitted. Yeah, I might, I might have missed that, it, yeah. Um, well, in the, while that's been looked for, Councillor Hart, I think you had a question or a comment. Thank you, Chair, thank you. And I really value this, this, this information, and I I'm, I'm just really want to acknowledge it must be such a tricky time for, you know, employees, employers, and I uh, and think people are really viewing their... One of the other documents, it talks about a, a sort of work-life balance, and I wonder if 2022 is the year of resignation because people are thinking it's more of a life-work balance, really. So, yeah, lots of questions. I, I, I just wanted to go back to the pie chart that the chair mentioned on um, chart six on page 45. And again, the, the numbers there would be useful, but I wondered, I, there were two dismissals due to, um, due to conduct. And so part of me thought, are they the people that said that they wouldn't work for SCDC again, or, or are they are? So I'm interested to if how those those um, those people, uh, you know, did, are they asked to rate? Does that fit into those those that feedback? So it's a question, really. What happens? Donya, not sure if you can answer. Yeah, that. so I can answer that one, and then I'll go back to Heather's questions as well, unless you've got any more, Sally. So um, in terms of. Uh, so a someone that is dismissed so due to conduct for example um that is classed as an involuntary lever and we would not do an exit interview with them and therefore we would not be capturing that information so so you can be assured that the information we've got on the exit interview is not someone that's uh, you know yet like i said been dismissed and then they're not happy and they're saying everything is poor and that kind of skews our figures so yeah so that's the answer to that one thank you and the question okay. councillor williams regarding the, the chart for agency stuff? Yep, um, I'll have to go back in and, and check where I've, where I've put that. I can't see it, uh, looking at what I've sent across, so I'll note that down to kind of then, and then share that information. I really am sorry, I thought I had included it in the document, so I apologize. Um, if I can go back to her comments on acting up and answer those questions, is that okay? Yes, please. Yep. Uh, so acting up in terms of how we're supporting them, um, obviously Jeff's outlined today in terms of uh, the manager training programme going forward. Uh, what we have done um, over the over over the last 12 months is uh, HR have run some internal um, uh, new manager training sessions that both new managers and existing managers can attend. Um, and uh, people that have been acting up, we have encouraged them to attend those as well. Um, it uh, in terms of pay um if they are acting up um, and they are recorded in in this way so i.e we are reported on that data that means that we do have the um we've received documentation in hr which means they are acting up into the next grade or whichever grade however many grades higher they're going um so that so they are being uh, uh compensated fairly in relation to that um and then in terms of the fill rate so the um looking at the particular uh figure uh let me scroll back up. Um, so it was a significant amount of roles advertised um, in quarter two um, that compared to previous quarters. So uh, 56 uh, roles advertised were the highest when looking at over the uh, over the previous uh, six quarters. Um, and um, and obviously um, quarter four was the nearest one in terms of uh, there were 40, 54 roles advertised and, and 40 were filled. Um, so that was a 74% rate. Um, so it's been 55% for quarter two. There were there has been work done. So particularly uh, in relation to uh, vacancies um, at the depot, so uh, refuse loaders and refuse um, drivers. We almost have a continuous vacancy uh, vacancy and recruitment drive going on. Um, and there was work done in terms of uh, looking at retention um, to those um, at the depot. So going forward, I think that will help uh, encourage um, lower uh, lower turnover at the depot. Um, and um, and potentially then have a positive impact in, from a from a fill rate and from a turnover point of view. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, we have two more speakers: Councillor John Williams and then Councillor Dawson. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to take us to the uh, report and the conclusions in the report, and in particular, paragraph 34 uh, on page 40, where we talk about flexible um, working policies. Um, I'd also like us to make reference to the uh, positive policies that we have to recruit those with disabilities and uh, those from ethnic minorities, uh, as well as flexible working, um, because clearly, um, hopefully, those policies are also helping uh, our recruitment efforts. Thanks. Thank you. I'm sure it's been noted, uh, Donya, if we could include that. Yeah, that has, yeah. Information. Thank you. And finally, Councillor Dawson, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Donya, for taking up my point about the contact centre. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier the, the issue of the great resignation, as it's called in, um, in press reports. I've read two press reports using the same, uh, the same phrase. Uh, and so um, the point in paragraph 31 on page 40, I think, is really important in, in that context. Uh, the number of staff who, internally, who transferred internally to new roles was the highest in over 12 months because I thought in the, in the context of the great resignation, it's really important that we keep hold of the staff that we've got and give them opportunities for internal transfer. So I just wondered what, you know, is there some work going on in that area? Donia? Sorry, I thought I was on mute then. Um, there's, there's a kind of general work in terms of uh, we, we communicate the recruitment team, recru recruitment, uh, sorry, let me restart. The recruitment team, um, they communicate on a weekly basis uh, the vacancies um, that we have across South Cams um, to, to all staff and on all staff email. Um, and um, obviously the the different things that we have in relation to the already existing acting up um options um they they're 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 kind of like pre-existing ongoing i don't think we've got anything specific lindsay i can see you've just put your camera on so i don't know if you wanted to add anything to that uh yeah the only other thing i was going to add on you is where we feel or where a manager feels that there is um, a, a sufficient pool to um fill the vacancy internally there are some vacancies that are only advertised internally we don't always go external with every vacancy so that can give an opportunity for staff to have an internal transfer contact uh, uh, thank you so um when somebody indicates that they're going to leave um in the exit interview is it always uh, asked of them, you know, had you thought of moving into a different job within the organisation? Uh, that specific question um, isn't, um, isn't in the exit interview, um, so specifically asking that. Um, the, the questions um, do, um, do include, you know, would you consider working for SCDC again? But we, um, we uh, don't look at, we don't ask that particular one. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. I think that's um, brought us to the end of speakers on that particular report. We've just been asked to, to note and comment, which I think we've done. Um, so with that, we'll move on to the next report on sickness and absence, which is agenda, agenda item eight on page 49. And Donya, we're back over to you. Yeah, um, so again, um, so with this report, we uh, this is a second quarter where we've been using uh, the iTrend data in this way, which means um, in a similar way that I asked for the turnover point of view, um, what we're what we are giving you is um, the overview kind of package, I guess, um, of all the data, which is why some of the charts look a little bit different. Um, but if there is any more detail that you want, we can we can look at going into that. Um, the um, sickness, um, so the sickness for quarter two uh, had reduced uh, slightly uh, compared to uh, quarter one. Um, so uh, sick days uh, per uh, full time equivalent. Um, so our BVPI figure 0.7 um, uh, on page 50 on the document is 1.82 days. Um, which is a decrease uh, from uh, 2.03 days um, for the previous quarter. Um, and it's also a, a decrease compared to quarter two, 2020 to 2021. Um, 
So there has been, though, a significant increase in um, MSK um, infections, COVID-19 and other. So for, for quarter one, particularly thinking about COVID-19 and infections, um, that, that number was particularly low. Um, but that has increased slightly in quarter two and then again in quarter three that's just completed now. Um, and in terms of the, the fact that we have had an increase in infections, it's just the fact that people were out and about uh, more than when we were in when we were in lockdown uh, the previous year. So um, it's natural that we are going to start to get some absence in relation to that. Um, uh, all um, so looking at working days lost. Um, um, so days lost, working cost 0.12. Also, service areas increased, uh, with the exception um, of shared wasted environment, which saw, which saw a reduction. Um, so they uh, they had a number of uh, long term absences in quarter one, uh, where the employees returned in quarter two, and that's what contributed to that figure. Um, in terms of uh, uh, stress, depression and mental health, the, the um, absences uh, increased um, slightly in quarter two. Now, the work that we do in the HR team, um, whenever we get a notification, so as soon as someone goes off sick, if someone uh, is off sick for stress or depression, we automatically allocate a HR advisor um, to, to that individual. And what that means, basically, is whereas potentially in the past, um, when we've managed absence cases, um, we... Um, uh, we would be managing them historically. So when we run absence triggers, so that they might be kind of like a month behind when things actually happen. With our new reporting um, tools, so with iTrend, we receive notifications as soon as the manager includes that absence, which means we can respond and react uh, like immediately. Um, so if someone does go off with stress or depression, what that means is the HR advisor would get in touch with the manager. We would try and understand if it was personal or work related and what we can do and try and put support in place kind of from the get go. Um, so from the start of that absence, so whether that's in relation to uh, we would always offer counselling um, and the two different counselling services we have. If it's in work related stress, we would be thinking about the stress identification tool. We would be checking with the manager and with the employee about the support that they get in from uh, from the GP and the local mental health team if, if appropriate. Um, and then we would be looking to facilitate a return to work as appropriate and as needed. Some stress and depression cases can be quite short term. Um, they might be only be off for one week or two weeks or some they might kind of be longer. But we think by having the earlier intervention from HR and providing that consistent approach uh, across absences, um, that 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 will have a that ha will have a positive impact on the individuals concerned, although um, I appreciate that they might still be off um, absent from work. It might be a shorter absence than if we had got involved at a later uh, later period. Um, so that was uh, my point that I wanted to make in relation to the stress and depression. Um, the uh, we've obviously got on uh, page 18. We've got the graph in relation to um, MSK. Um, uh, and back and neck, back and neck pain absences, um, and then. Uh, 19 COVID-19 uh, COVID absences. So um, this is the number of days absence. So this is still really relatively, relatively small uh, when you think about it. Absences for the whole quarter uh, for COVID. Um, we're looking at, I think, uh, uh, I'm trying to do the maths off of my head. Uh, and I'm uh, 15, uh, 55, 63, 64, 63, I think about 67 days worth 67, of um, I made it. Yeah. yeah, 67. So so when you think about it, it's really kind of a relatively small amount compared to other absence reasons across the quarter. Um and and so that's just kind of I guess a, a, a point to note. Obviously, um, you know, a lot of us are working from home. Uh, and so for the people that are working from home that are uh, normally asymptomatic but there could be some some symptomatic but with with relatively few symptoms um if they're able to continue working then they're, they're not recorded as having uh, a covid-19 absence because obviously they're not absent from work um so this figure doesn't doesn't include that information um so yeah uh, they were my points to note on covid um we've included a lot of information about the training that we offered um, and then the the final points um, around um, uh, so point 25 in terms of thinking about musculoskeletal absences um, and the DSC assessments um, so um, we um, have had uh, 377 employees 
of approximately it will be in the kind of 500s of people that would be eligible um, for for that have completed the DSC assessment. Now I know the corporate um, health and safety advisor um, is back and kind of looking at that and looking at how we can increase that figure over the next couple of quarters. So we should see an increase um, in that um, in quarter uh, quarter three and quarter four. Um, and then the information in terms of from Viva from point 26, these are very kind of specific stats around um, who, you know, who's accessed the CBT resources, um, calls made to helpline um, and also um, uh, calls um, accessing counselling um, and video counselling. So hopefully by including that information at that level of detail uh, that we might not have included on previous quarters, hopefully that kind of gives you a bigger picture about things um, and a, a, a bigger picture and a little bit more detail and hopefully you find that useful. Um, so that's me kind of summarising the report there. Superb, very uh, very detailed introduction. I really appreciate the uh, the effort that goes into these reports. Um, I've got one question so far, which is from Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. It's page 52. Um, one of the first things I thought was um, a lot of the COVID-19 absences were in housing, whether we whether there's more we can do to, to help um, those... Uh, those offices in, in housing, and there's a particular reason for that, because it does seem to be the biggest swathe of it. Um, I was also wondering whether, so COVID-19 absences, and then when you read on, it says about 73 days were, were lost, but it's isolation or asymptomatic. In my mind, they are still COVID-related absences. Um, it is the impact of COVID, it is the cost of, of COVID, because, you know, people are still being paid for that period and everything else. So I'm wondering whether it's wrong to actually, we don't get the true picture. I think um, if it's COVID related while people are absent for work, be it because they've got it, they're isolating or anything else, it is a COVID related absence and therefore um, sh should fall in that category for me personally. I think if you want to separate the infection rates of people that are actually infected, then, then that should be COVID-19 cases that are absent rather than absences in relation to COVID. Um, but I would be, I would personally be interested in both, particularly when we're looking at, you know, the cost to the council and, and we, if we do end up trying to, to claim in any way, it'd be useful to have that information. Um, I also note it says about um, close contacts with people not being vaccinated. Um, obviously, vaccines is a personal choice, um, but are we ensuring that we're making sure vaccines are available to people? And so if there's anybody in that category that wants to be vaccinated, but for one re reason or another is, is having difficulty in accessing vaccine, um, what are we doing to, um, to make sure it's available to them, um, whether that's time off work or, or whatever it may be? Um, so that's, that's it from me. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. A few questions there, Donya. I think the first one was around why yeah. so many absences in housing. And as a follow up, is there anything we can do to, to help reduce that number? Um, and then I think there was a request to include the days lost at the depot um, due to isolation, I think, in the in the future numbers, albeit it doesn't count as a sick day. Um, and then a question around the vaccines as well, please. OK, um, so the first one, um, housing. So um, the uh, people that were off, off sick, um, you know, a, a couple of them, I did look at the, de the detail and a couple of them were frontline workers. Um, and so therefore, by the very nature of, uh, you know, so, for example, there might have been cleaners um, uh, or, or uh, sheltered estate officers. So they will be going in um like going to more properties and therefore potentially be more at risk um, of catching COVID versus someone that is a home worker um, and therefore the uh, the only risk that, that a home worker may have would be from a personal life point of view as opposed to from a working condition point of view. Um, so so um, your question in terms of what we can do to help, um, I can speak to um, our colleagues in housing, um, looking, speaking to the managers and seeing um, what we can do uh, to address that figure. Uh, so I'll just write down to do that. Um, and then... Um, in relation to the isolation and asymptomatic, so um, I completely um, uh, understand uh, and take your point in terms of knowing the figures. And we've obviously included that in the report in terms of the number of days lost at the depot. So the 73 days lost in total. Um, the, the graph um, at 
on chart 19 relates to sickness absences and um, the 73 days lost. So it's a technicality. Um, so the 73 days lost that these people are not recorded as, as sick absent. They're just recorded in their normal later hour, uh, rotor hours. Um, and um, therefore, um, we are losing the productivity but it's not a sickness absence. We could uh, we could include, so uh, we could have as a first graph, uh, total COVID, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, uh, total COVID, um, uh, I suppose it would be still be day, days lost, it just wouldn't be absences because you would be looking at both absences and like I said, productive days. So we could include a total figure from that point of view and then separate it into sickness, absence and isolation like we've had, if, yeah. that, if that would be useful to, I, to the I think that would be handy just to have two yeah. graphs, okay. uh, just so we as a committee can get a full picture about how many days, whether they're official recorded sicknesses or not, the only... um, we are losing to COVID. So I think that was one of the reasons we wanted to include the COVID stats separately when um, when we first you know hit the pandemic. So if if that could be included in the next report, that would be useful. As Donya got off in a half. <laughs> no, you're back, Donya. We got you. Okay, you got me. Yeah. 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 Can you hear me? Okay. okay yes. Perfect. You're, you're no, fine. I hadn't. I, I hadn't gone off in a half. Um, so the only thing that I would say, um, obviously, um, is that we, for the, uh, well, it's, it's just to note that people that are working, uh, yeah, obviously, that, ignore my point. I was just trying to get my head in a bit of a, a muddle there. No, ignore my point. Yes, I'll do a total graph. That's not a problem. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much, Donia. Um, and, and, then the, and then the final point around people not vaccinated and how we can yes. support them. Um, I will um, uh, have a chat with Lindsay um, and um, because th these points uh, relate to people at the depot specifically um, and see what we can do to take that one forward. Great. Thank you very much, Donia. And Councillor Howell, please. Thank you, Chairman. Two possibly quick questions or two lengthy questions. Uh, I'll ask my first question. Uh, do we keep a record of which staff have been vaccinated? Uh, okay, so I'll finish writing down that point. Um, in terms of specific individuals, uh, so in relation to the depot, um, they um, know the information um, so that we know um, when it comes to isolation, um, if um, if people are able to continue to work, um, if they're tested negative or if they need to fully um, isolate. What we don't do is we don't have a list of every employee across the council and their vac vaccination status. We just have the information at the depot in relation to their employees. Oh, were you actually allowed to ask that? Is out of interest if people have been vaccinated? Well, I think we can ask, but we can't I, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's a GDPR question. Are we allowed to ask people if they have been or not? I think I think we can in this relation in terms of to assess whether or not they um, they need to isolate or whether or not they are able to return to work. The employee can choose to not give us that information. That that is it's still a choice. Um, we we don't. It's not like a, a, a you know definitive. But yeah. Chairman, then my second question is, uh, and maybe I, I should be asking Councillor John Williams this. So forgive me, but I'll ask it in general terms. Are we going to look at any, are we having any discussions or are we looking at any plans to, um, with regards to people being paid for going off sick who have not, or chosen for whatever reason, not to be vaccinated as to those who have been vaccinated as other companies are now doing? Um, I'm going to um, ask Lindsay if she can come in on that point because I know there was some communication previously. I, I, I'll change my question slightly then, Lindsay. Yeah. Um, can I ask Councillor John Williams if any discussions are, are currently taking place? I think that'd be better if it comes from John. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, as far as Cabinet is concerned, no. Thank you, Chairman. I don't need to know any more at this point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, Councillor Heather Williams, yes, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I just I just wanted to be clear as well um, with the when I asked about the vaccination, it was about council workers in in general, whether they work at the depot. I don't want us to get into a, a situation where we're singling out the depot here. Yeah, it's just about making sure that we are being, 
you know, as helpful as it, as it is possible for, for people to get um, vaccines, because, for example, some people might need time off work, um, particularly if, if you're a single parent, you, you're not going to be able to do it um, outside school hours or things like that. So it's more about um, how we're being as an employer and encouraging and making sure it's accessible or having a you know vaccination day at the council or, or whatever it it might um, fall because things like the flu vaccine we as a council yep. I did get after the the uh, I don't know if you got yours Henry but after this meeting I was able to have my flu jab which was very helpful um, and uh, but yeah it's so the the council as an employer could be a way of making it more accessible to people as well so it's but that I think just want to make it clear that's across the council, and, council and not singling yep. depot out bless them. Sure, that's fine. I yeah. think that's been noted. But uh, <laughs> yeah. unless yeah, you wanted so to comment on that, Donya, briefly. Yeah, just to add, um, uh, you know, employees uh, across the council, and I, and I know that from, um, you know, from experience of uh, speaking to other colleagues um, in different areas, um, you can get, um, you can use your flexi to get time off to have the appointment. And, and certainly that's what, uh, like, the majority of people um, uh, seem to do. Uh, so, the, so the option is there. And if, from a communication point of view, um, on our staff page where we're talking about uh, COVID guidance, uh, we are really clear in terms of the information about the vaccination programme um, and supporting um, employees in that way. Um, we haven't got um, any, um, I don't think um, HEALS are looking at doing any specific days in relation to COVID-19 vaccinations because they've obviously been delivered through the NHS. I know there's work being done around flu vaccination clinics for later on this year, um, like, like, have been, like were done uh, last year. Um, it was just on the, the way our flexi pay scheme works as well is that it's sort of capped. You can only roll so much over and I know some people quite reliant on that. So I'm just um, for other reasons. So I appreciate that might be something that's used. But now we're at the point where people that can use that facility have maybe um, this might be more of a cabinet thing. If we if we could look at saying that, you know, you, you will still be paid even if you have to take a, an hour off to have a vaccine rather than having to ask them to forfeit a, a privilege um, or forfeit um, wages for for that because not everybody will get flexi pay or be able to build that up or or will have to use it for other reasons chair so just a suggestion there um, um, or maybe asking people that are happy to say they're unvaccinated um, whether it is access or, or personal choice because obviously you know people have that choice absolutely thank you I think that's been noted in the minutes and obviously Councillor Williams has heard your, your comments as well so, thank you very much, members. I don't believe there's any further questions or comments on the uh, on the figures for the last quarter. So we've just been asked to note those, which I think we have done. So thank you very much, Donya, for your your diligence in answering all the questions we have. Um, and yeah, look forward to seeing the next quarter's reports. So, members, we now go to the final item, which is an update on the disability confident task and finish group. And I believe we have. Lindsay on the line, who's going to present this and uh, take any questions we may have. Yeah, hello again, everyone. Um, yeah, I was just asked to give an update on the um, disability confidence scheme. Um, I believe that Councillor Chung Johnson had um, asked previously if the task and finish group had needed to continue. So um, the the Disability Confidence Scheme is a government initiative which obviously aims to help employers um, employ and retain people with disabilities. There's three different levels to the scheme. Uh, previously, the Council had Level 1 and then from April last year, we achieved Level 2 accreditation. To enable us to do that, we had to complete a self-assessment and it covered a whole range of activities that we needed to commit to um, to do. Um, and in regards to that, it's, it's around recruit, recruiting the right people for our organisation and also retaining and developing our staff. So we have um, got some of these initiatives we've already um, put in place and there's others that we are still working on. So. In terms of raising um, awareness of us as a disability confident employer, we have that logo on our website. We use it in all our recruitment materials. We've been having conversations with some of the disability charities as to how we can promote our vacancies um, to a wider pool of talent. Um, we had planned to do a disability um, assessment of our facilities, but that had 
had to be put on hold because of the COVID regulations. Uh, but that is something that we will do when, when we're able to. Um, any new employees um, that need support through, um, sorry, any new employees that may need support to come and have an interview, we would put any adjustments in place to enable that to happen for them. Um, again, if we are appointing anyone with a disability, we would um, liaise with our occupational health provider to ensure that we are putting any reasonable adjustments in place to enable them to um, work for us. Same goes with existing employees who may then develop a disability during their employment with us. And um, other things that we've done, we're, we're currently um, speaking with a provider in regards to delivering disability awareness training, and that will be rolled out this year, both to staff and members. And also, um, just before Christmas, um, our equalities, um, well, within our policy and performance team, who deal with a lot of the equalities work, they, they were promoting Disability History Month. So we've done quite a lot in terms of raising our, our profile and our reach and, and how we can support our employees. Um, there's still more work that we can do on the level two, um, but the next level that we might wish to consider is moving to level three. So when you become a level three disability competent employer, you're then called a leader. And um, for that to happen, there's a few other criteria that we need to meet. So the self-assessment that we completed for level two would need to be validated by an external organisation um, to ensure that we're delivering on all the activities that we that, that we said we would. Um, we also would need to, um, as it says here, provide a narrative on the activities we have or are taken in terms of us being a disability competent leader. And also we would be reporting on our disability, mental health and well-being um, in the workplace. So it's again, I, I would say it's it's consideration. I think at at some point, we should be considering moving to level three, whether that now is the right time for that to happen. Um, obviously, we achieved level two just under a year ago, and there is more work that we can be done. Um, so I guess it's 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 really to give you the information of where we're at now, what we could do in the future. And I think, it, it, you know, it's whether to consider if that task and finish group needs to continue um, to think about what we want to do moving forward. Okay, great. So I think the takeaway from the last meeting we had after the request from um, Councillor June Johnson to wind up the group uh, was exactly what you've just described, was to let us know what it will take to get to the next level, i.e. level three, and whether mm -hmm. we actually want to start exploring that. Um, I mean, given the information that uh, Lindsay's given us now, members, that's a decision, or at least a well, decision around the task and finish group, and obviously we need to give officers some direction as well. So, I mean, I'd be interested to hear people's thoughts on this as to whether we want to continue with the task and finish group um, and try and you know, strengthen our level two status and then eventually move to level three. Um, so if anyone has any thoughts around that or equally any questions for Lindsay around the scheme in general, um, you know, I'd be happy to take those now, starting with Councillor Howell. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Chairman, if you are, you just ask me to look at the bottom of page two. Chairman, could you just look at the bottom of page two of the report, the minutes? Um, what you will see there is the Disability Conference Task and Finish Group, where I specifically asked for a paper to be written, Sir Chairman, which the committee agreed, and you seconded that for today's meeting. So it's disappointing that we haven't had a paper written. Um, that we could have done that. You see it, uh, Kent, we have had a supplementary paper. Oh, you have? I following haven't seen this. that. It was, I appreciate it was circulated quite late yesterday, but we were, oh. were sent a, a supplementary document. Okay, well, that's a disappointing, Chairman, but there we are. So, um, Chairman, if you also recall that I have been quite happy to say that we should stick to Level 2 at this particular stage until we get all of Level 2 and it's implemented throughout the Council we try, before we try to go to anything else with regards to a Level 3. And therefore, I think it's very important that we do that, we embed it in the council and then go on to the next one, not just trying to get the next level up. Um, I'd just like to ask a very quick question. So is the council yet a double-tick employer? 
Um, the, double, the disability confidence scheme replaced what used to be the yeah. two tech employer. Yeah. So, it's, so are, we, are we now the equivalent of that? I would, to be honest, I would need to check what the criteria was for the two techs and the criteria is being a level two disability confident employer, because my understanding is that the, the two tech system doesn't exist anymore. What we needed to do to be a two tech employer, I would need to check what that criteria was to see if what we're at now matches that. Okay. Chairman, may I ask that, I mean, in June, when, the meeting, when this committee meets next, um, we might not be here, some it might be changed, and we can look at it then. I think that would be the best time to re-evaluate whether or not it's, we should go ahead or not with regards to this particular task and finish group, and not make that decision now. Apologise, Chairman, I haven't seen this supplementary document. It's, it, it, it's passing by. No, appreciate it. It was circulated um, yesterday, so it didn't give us much time to... To, to take it in, so you know, I do apologise for the lateness of that report, Councillor. Um, I see Councillor Williams, but we do have a few other speakers beforehand. Councillor Dornton, next, please. Yes, thank you. Um, Lindsay, you referred, you, you used the word workplace. Um, now, obviously, we've had two papers earlier in the meeting um, dealing with workplace and work practices. So I wonder where we are now in terms of uh, being disability confident and being a good disability employer, where we're actually changing the whole nature of workplace. Um, I wonder if you could comment on that, what that means uh, for being a disability confident employer and, and how we're tackling that. Yeah, so if, um, as a lot of us have been working from home, obviously, for, for almost two years, if we have an employee that has um, needs for special equipment or something to enable them to work from home, then we would still consider what we can provide for them. So we would refer them to our occupational health provider um, and any reasonable adjustments that we would put in place, we would consider how we could do that whilst they are working from home. There's also another organisation called Access to Work, which is a government organisation. And again, we they can the employee themselves has to complete the application, but through an access to work, um, sorry, an access to work application, they would be assessed and then they would advise us what equipment they would need to enable them to um, do their role. And, and as their employer, we've got a duty to, to um, enable them to have that equipment. Um, the only thing to, to say is it's what is reasonable. So, um, but yeah, we, we, we certainly um, consider any requests and, and, and we put stuff in place. So whether it's software or hardware or equipment, we tend to do that. Can I, can I just come back on that? Um, yes, thank you. That, that's very helpful. I was also thinking more broadly, um, some disabilities are not necessarily to do with equipment. Yeah. Some disabilities are actually to do with a way of working, working yeah. alone, working in teams or not. So do we... Are we fully cognizant of that? Do we take that on board? Yeah, so the although we've predominantly been working from home, the office is still open for people that need to go and work in the office, um, if that's for health reasons or other personal reasons. So we would be expecting an employee, if, if, they, if they do have a need, that they would either be speaking to their line manager or someone in the HR team, and we would provide that support to enable them if they needed to work in the office rather than work from home, that they could do that. Or it may be that they're happy to work from home, but need more regular check-ins with either the line manager or HR or someone else to ensure they're, they're getting the support that we need. They need, sorry. Thank you. Councillor Percival. Thank you. Um, I would just echo the point that was made previously um, that I think that we may be better to retain our level two um, status and continue to work on more initiatives um, to, to help retain, um, retain that membership. I think um, it might be careless at this time to progress to level three. 
I think that people who have disabilities aren't necessarily going to approach an employer and ask what level of disability confident do you have. I think actually just having the status and the logo in itself make, makes us a, a statement, a clear statement. So I think we should retain level two for the interim and continue to um, progress progress work and initiatives around that effort. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Hart, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and just, just a, a, another question, really. I, and I mean, I agree, I think, you know, need to make sure that this isn't a, a tick box exercise and that we're embedded at, at level two. And, and thank you for flagging up that there's still some things to work on there. I just noticed that under the challenge at level three, the last uh, point that says that we are employing disabled people. I mean, I'd like to assume we're already doing that. Is that is oh, yeah, that absolutely. Level three? So I just really yeah. wanted to ask a question, and I'm aware I'm perhaps playing catch up a, a, a bit with this, but uh, just what percentage of our workforce, you know, currently identify with with a disability, and how that compares with other with other councils? Do you have that information? I don't have the figure um, off the top of my head, um, but it is something that we do. Um, well, when when we have a new starter, they fill in a new employee form, and we do ask that question on there. Um, but just to be mindful that there's always a prefer not to say box. So we we know the ones that have declared a disability, but there could be some people who have a disability, but they choose not to declare it. Therefore, we wouldn't know. And I'm just thinking, if I could come back on that, uh, and thinking about sometimes people... Um, have a disability identified later after they've already yeah. started working and how we could perhaps capture that, but that information but i certainly would value being able to have some information on the sort of the level that where people do you know quite rightly if they choose not to that's that's their right but to do declare it i think it might mm -hmm. be good for us to have that information in terms of the percentage of our employers yeah yeah sorry i don't have that information to hand today but it is something that we do and um, record thank you thank you very much and finally, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have to say that the note that came round yesterday um, isn't quite the paper, I think, that we'd have been. So I think on the decision to whether we disband or keep the task and finish group going, I think we need a bit more than what's here to make an informed decision on that. So I would suggest that we defer that decision until we've got more, um, more substantial information as to what what's the... Um, what the benefits to the task and finish group, what it could or couldn't do, that's something that's not recognised, or actually what the task and finish group itself has achieved and what actually we would, as has been said, we were doing anyway. So we haven't got any of that information, which is what we really wanted to know the benefit of the finish group as to whether it should be disbanded or continued. So I'm afraid we, we, we can't make an informed decision on the, on the note that's here. It's not what was asked. Um, however, when it comes to the, the levels and what we should be pursuing... I think the most important thing of this is that it is genuine and authentic and not tick box and not just trying to get a badge or a logo or anything like that. Um, and I, with that in mind, I think it's important that we do it properly and not, and not just rush through. So as others have said, I think we're at level two. Let's make sure that that is um, properly implemented and regarded throughout the council before progressing. So I'm, I'm minded to agree with others on that. And actually, perhaps when we do get the paper coming forward, we can see how um, see how they, this has been implemented, um, rather than just the requirements of the of the scheme. Because any of us can look that up on the government website. What we want to know is how that is personal to the council. Um, so there are my comments, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. I think those are the last speakers I had. So um, what I've been hearing so far is I think most members that have spoken have uh, tend to be in agreement that we should continue striving to strengthen our level two status rather than try and progress to, uh, to level three as it may be a bit too premature. Um, regarding the task and finish group itself, I probably agree. I don't think we're in a position today to make a decision about whether they should carry on or be disbanded. So what my suggestion would be would be to bring a fuller um, paper on this item to our next committee meeting. Um, but as a, some feedback to you, Lindsay, and officers, I think um, continuing down the path of trying to strengthen our level two status seems to be the, uh, the majority um, view here. So if hopefully that's helpful for you on that front. And I said if we 
if it's possible, if we could have a, um, a fuller paper on the task and finish group itself about what they've done to date, um, the type of work they would probably need to undertake to get to level three and what specifically that means for, for South Camps District Council. I think that would be, be handy. We could have that for our next committee meeting. Yeah, no problem. Okay, um, members, are we agreed with that way forward? I haven't heard any views any other way, so can we take that as a, by affirmation? Superb. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lindsay. No problem. Okay, members. Well, that concludes all the business we have on the agenda today. Uh, obviously, the date of the next meeting is some way in the future. On the 9th of June, we're currently penciled in for. Uh, I believe there is a reason for that, which I think uh, Lawrence has volunteered to explain for us. Chair, sure. um, yes. Yeah, so, essentially, the, we're having a bit of a circuit breaker. So, I believe we've made comments in the past about assessing reports that are not from the previous quarter, but the quarter prior to that. So the plan moving forward is to have a double header meeting where we can deal with two quarters worth of reports. And then moving forward from there, it will just be, we'll be assessing the quarter prior to that. Now, I think the chair is happy that if we feel a need to introduce another meeting between now and June, that we can do that. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. Um, and any information on all the policies and anything we've discussed today, I will ensure that you've kept in the loop uh, with any relevant information. Sure, absolutely. Councillor Williams. Come in. I'll say, if, um, I think there has been a frustration with the quarters, especially when we're looking at the sickness. It seems bizarre to be saying we've got such low numbers in, in the depot when we've had to, you know, suspend green bin collections. So. Um, I, I agree with the, the stance that's been taken. However, any information that has been requested, for example, like the agency staff, I, I would like within, at least within a fortnight chair of this meeting, because sure. otherwise sometimes we don't get that information until you know, 24 hours before the next meeting, and that, that's too long. So if we could perhaps um, put a deadline in for, for responses, chair. Yeah, please. I'm sure the officers um, who need to source that information are still on the call. So if that could be noted, please, officers, any information that has been requested, if we could get that sooner rather than later, I think that would be hugely welcomed by committee members. I see lots of faces appearing, so I'm taking that as a yes. <laughs> OK, thank you very much, members. Um, and we'll see you all in June, if not before. Take care. <laughs>